Good morning to you all. Is this on? Okay, yes. <laughs> on this beautiful Sunday morning, the Lord be with you. With these gracious words, we begin this time of worship, this sacred pause, your time with the Lord. So let us fully arrive and savor the moment of worship to be refreshed, renewed, and recreated. So um, in case you haven't noticed, there's a few more people in town this weekend. We welcome back any Miami students to Oxford returning and first year students and hope you'll consider worshiping with us during your school year. Why aren't you in the choir there? Here's a <laughs> one of our choir students has returned, Ashley. So <laughs> um, we arranged this beautiful weekend just for you for move-in weekend. And if you'll recall, it was just a year ago on a Miami move-in weekend that uh, Pastor Lawrence, Amy, and Jens um, arrived in Oxford. And so we're so glad that you're here. I, where'd that first year go, huh? <laughs> it's amazing. Um, Pastor Lawrence is away this Sunday uh, with five other church members on a mission trip to Barranquilla, Colombia. Um, Bridget, our um, administrative assistant, received an email from Dave Wilson on Friday and saying that everybody arrives safe and sound, and we'll have to be sure and keep them um, in our prayers uh, all this week. Um, while Pastor Lawrence preaches at the Seventh Presbyterian Church in Barranquilla, we welcome the Reverend Marcy Bain. Do you want to stand and so they can see you? <laughs> She's a native Daytonian. Uh, Reverend Bain is a graduate of the Princeton Theological Seminary, and she is currently working full-time as a civil servant at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, and she's also an ordained teaching elder in the PCUSA. She's active in the Presbytery of the Miami Valley, where she's the committee chair for Network, Support, and Grants Committee. She's very much looking forward to share in the worship with the OPC family today. We ask if you'll prayerfully read the ministry and fellowship events. Uh, noted in the bulletin, but I'd like to um, highlight a few of them. Please take a moment to um, fill out the blue friendship um, folder in the pew. It's right at the end of the pews here. Um, all are welcome to our time of fellowship following worship. I'm not sure if it's in the courtyard or the uh, Molino Lounge, but right through this door anyway. <laughs> um, if this is the first time you're visiting us today, a special welcome to you. And as you depart, we'd like you to receive one of these folders. And you'll find a couple out here um, right outside the door or in the um, narthex, narthex area. This Tuesday, August 29th, is a progressive Christian campus ministry kicked off, kickoff at uh, Graders at 8 o'clock. And there are brochures, brochures available at the entrance of the sanctuary and outside the church office or our website if you're interested. Also, this Wednesday is the community dinner at the seminary church at 530. If you would like to help, is Bill Fisher here? Bill, yes, yeah, see Bill. And if you need to help or would you like to donate some money? <laughs> and finally... We would like for anyone interested, students, long or short time members, old or young, to consider singing in our choir. It's really a lot of fun. Jack Lyle is directing us today as Kent is on vacation. He's been on vacation for the past three weeks, but he'll return next week. And it's just a lot of fun. Um, and we're also blessed to have one of the best organists you ever want to hear with Lynn Jacobs. So she, she's incredible. And I just know that Mike Irwin, Mike, give a little wave. He's our only base. He is a section unto himself. So if anybody would like to come join him, that would be terrific. Um, we meet on Thursday evenings from 7.30 to 8.30, starting after Labor Day, and then Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock. Um, so if you're interested, just see any of the choir members, and we'd love to have you. Now let us turn our hearts and minds to worship our Lord.
All those who are able, I would invite you to stand as we share together in the call to worship. O oh Lord, you reveal wisdom and spiritual insight through your presence in creation. When we look at the heavens, we see your vastness. When we look at seas teeming with fish and verdant fields painted like a canvas, we see your creativity and your bounty. Your name is majestic, compassionate, glorious, and inspiring. Your name is beautiful, tender, amazing, powerful, and all-encompassing, Lord. For all this and so much more, we praise your name. Let us worship God. Our hymn is All Creatures of Our God and King, number 15.
Please remain standing. Good morning. Christ's call in our lives comes unexpectedly. God comes to us today, for now is the time to turn to Christ once more. Please join me in the prayer of confession in your bulletin. As the people of God, let us now confess our sin. God, our fears and prejudices run deep. Sometimes we can only see our own point of view. We stick with those who are like us rarely venturing outside our comfort zones. We do not hear those crying for justice and true peace. We blame those who are suffering and in need, instead of standing by them. We deny the power of your gospel to unite us with those who are different from us. Lord, give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Open us to new possibilities of life for all of your people, and use us to enact the new life given in Christ. Let us now take a moment for personal prayer and confession. Amen. Christ died for us Christ rose from the grave, conquering sin and death. He makes all things new. He continually makes each one of us new, and he calls us into the new life he has prepared for us. Know that you are forgiven, and be at peace. The peace of Christ be with you. Today we have some people who are worshiping with us for the first time. Uh, during our time of sharing the peace, please introduce yourself to these new people. All are welcome in this place. Forgiven in Christ, please greet those around you with the peace of Christ be with you. Have you guys peacified the choir? Make sure you peacify the guest pastor too, because she's new and she has to know us and you need to know her. Shall we peacify? Here it comes. Sanity rules. Good morning, my friends. So did you notice my hat? Did you notice my hat? <laughs> yes, it's a snake. It's a snake. You guys want to see her? All right, there you go. You can unwrap her, pass her around. And since that one's going that way, I brought something else to pass around this way. And it is a... It's a ducky, that's right. It's a ducky. So I have to tell you, <clears throat> her name is Dawn, and her last name is Tread on Me. And some of you might get that. Dawn Tread on Me. Ah, I know. <laughs> That's just quackers. But 
Dawn had an auspicious beginning. She did. She didn't look like this at all. Want to see her? She looked like a piece of muddy yarn that someone had thrown in a tree at Kroger. You know, they thought they were going to decorate Kroger's tree, so they thought they would just throw that ball of yarn in the tree. Well, <clears throat> I don't always go for those kinds of things. I think that yarn can be used for better things. I think that yarn can be something kind of cool. So much to my husband's chagrin, because, you know, he was looking at me like, there she goes again. I tugged that yarn out of the tree, and I took it into coffee with my friends, and it was wet and gooey. So I didn't roll it up right then. What I did was I took it home, and I laid it out, and I dried it. Oh, yeah, I've got some more stuff. And basically what happened was it looked something like this. You want to pass that along to look at it? It is a yarn ball. It, that's what Dawn kind of looked like. And isn't that a beautiful ball? Well, I got it because I was going to make some stuff. And it was a beautiful, beautiful ball. But you know what? I saw a little bit more in that ball of yarn than just a beautiful ball of yarn just as it was. So I got out my hook. You want to see what else is in there? Here's some more yarn. You want to pass that one way, that way? And I got out my hook, which I hope is still in here. Let's see what I've got. I've got this. And I started crocheting. It is, it's actually called a crochet hook. And what happened was that Dawn, she got a head, and then she got a body, and then she got a tail, and then she got eyes and a nose and a mouth. And she became who she is. A snake. That's exactly right. A beautiful little snake. And you know, when I think about it, she was beautiful where she was. She could have just sat on my shelf as a ball of yarn. But that's kind of like God treats me. You know, I could have been sitting at home watching cartoons this morning, right? Or I could have a lot of times said, I can't sing the choir <clears throat> because I get all choked up. And I can't do a children's message because I'm really shy. But in God's hands, I could do just a little more. Be just a little bit better. Just a little bit better. You guys want to see the sparkly stuff? I know. Isn't that lovely? So that is why I wanted to tell you about Dawn. Because you know what? I believe that God has something in mind for each and every one of us. Maybe we didn't, don't always know. Maybe we're kind of like hunting for it, thinking about it, wondering about it, maybe even worrying about it. And then all of a sudden it comes and we know what we're supposed to be doing. Yeah. And that is what happens with that. Some people talk about God being a great potter. Do you know what a potter is? You guys ever seen a potting wheel? Okay. Yeah. Those things are really cool. They run around really fast, and they, they make a pot, but I've never been really good at that. Not that I don't like to get my hands in the mud. But I kind of think of God as the great crocheter. Starts with something that looks like something that isn't anything, and then makes it really special. So, if we really wanted to get down to it, even before that ball of yarn was a beautifully colored ball of yarn, it was cotton in a field growing on a plant. So even before it even had the potential of even thinking about being yarn, it started there. Just we, like we kind of start out. All right, <clears throat> Dawn and I need to send you off to church school so you can think about this. Think about it. No matter what you think you can do, I bet that God can do more with you. So, what do we do every Sunday? That's right. I'm going to grab my bag of stuff. Cross your arms. Right over left, right over left, right over left. Hey, Lo, you want to get in, honey? Do you want to get in? You do not have to cross because. There we go. All right. I know you have big voices. Are you ready? No matter. Who you are. No matter. 
And no matter where you go, you are always loved by God. Amen. That's right. Twist out of here. Be more than the strings that we are. <laughs> All right. Does the congregation have a blessing for you? And you all have a blessing for the congregation? May God be with you that heal. Absolutely. <laughs> Please join me now for the unison prayer of illumination. Holy God, word made flesh, let us come to this word open to being surprised. Silence our agendas, banish our assumptions, cast out our casual detachment, confound our expectations, clear the cobwebs from our ears, penetrate the corners of our hearts with this word. We know that you can, we pray that you will, and we wait with great anticipation. The scripture reading for today is from Genesis chapter 1 verses 20 through 31. And God said, Let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind with which the waters swarm and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. He blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things, and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind and the cattle of every kind and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish, and over the birds, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, See, I have given you every plant that yields seed upon the face of the earth. I have given you every tree with seeds and its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, Everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Holy wisdom, holy word. Well, good morning. As we get started this morning, I was, I was uh, speaking with office staff and with, with the liturgist, and I said, I, you know, I have to uh, share a confession with you all. I graduated from Ohio University, and so here I am, a bobcat in a Miami University pulpit, and I am so grateful for the love of God that knocks down even university rivalries to, uh, to be able to share worship with all of you this morning. As we, as we dive into the text this morning, I want us to be centering on this idea of story. Where we start a story really matters. 
Our starting place sets our expectations, and it also determines where we think we're going. So here we have this beautiful poem in Genesis. And, and the people who heard this poem in Genesis, they were asking questions. They weren't really asking questions of scientific origin. They were asking questions that one theologian calls questions of ultimate concern. That is to say, they were asking these really rich and deep existential questions. They, they were asking, who is God? And, and who are we? They were asking the question, where do we come from? What is the story of the universe? What is the story of our world? What is the collective human story? Now imagine with me, if you will, that we have all been transported back in time and we're huddled around a campfire thousands of years ago with our family tribe. And maybe we're in the desert somewhere in the cradle of civilization, somewhere in Africa or the Middle East, and, and the nighttime sky around us is bright. It's so very bright. And, and we look up and see a shooting star or two, and we're just wrapped with wonder. And suddenly, an elder from our family gets up to speak. And tonight, tonight, maybe it's a grandfather, tonight he is going to tell us our origin story. A story that's going to help us make sense of this vast world of ours and help us locate our place in it. He begins this sacred story. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the Spirit of God is hovering over a dark, formless void, and suddenly God gives it shape and meaning and depth. God creates light and dark. God se separates the water from the sky and the water from the land. And what happens next? What happens next, friends, is awakening. The Spirit of God, like a divine hum, is moving through our world. Like a divine hum, the Spirit is stitched into the fabric of our universe, and it begins to burst at the seams with an outpouring of creation, with an outpouring of life. Water brings forth swarm of living creatures. And suddenly there are birds in the sky and there are animals on the ground. There's a command to be fruitful and multiply. Our world has come alive and God speaks and commands, let the earth bring forth every kind of different creature. And it does. And in repetition, after every single one of these acts of creation, God says, it is good, it is good, it is so very good. The Hebrew word for good is tov. And I want you all to say it with me now to practice how this feels on our tongue. Tov. Ready? Tov. One more time. Tov. Tov is, is the Hebrew word for good and beautiful, but, but in this poem it means so much more than that. It means harmonious. It means flourishing. It means growing. It means dynamic. Our world is tov. It is good. And this is where we start our story. And where we start our story matters because it sets our expectations, it orients us, it provides us a framework, it gives us a sense of where we'd like to go. Now, let me pose a second question. What if, what if we started our story somewhere else? What, what if we started our story Everything is awful, and there was economic anxiety, and there was war, and people don't have the capacity to be good or kind, and they'll never overcome their pride, and they've replaced vulnerability with fear, and they'll probably all just kill each other and take all of the resources. What, what, where do we think that narrative is going? What, what does that narrative tell us about who we are or what is possible? And, what are we even motivated to try to do if we start with that narrative? It's a mighty, mighty different starting place for a story. Throughout history, many Western Christian traditions have started the Christian story precisely 
in this latter way. Because they have started the story with Genesis 3, the story about the fall of humankind. And I know you're all familiar with the story, the story of Adam, Eve, and the serpent, and the most unfortunate piece of fruit in human history. Now, the doctrine of original sin comes to us from Augustine, reflecting on the passage of Genesis chapter 3. And when we're talking about original sin, we're talking about sin that is innate to us, sin that is inherited and passed down to generations. That is to say, we're born in a sinful state. We're born lacking human wholeness. And before I go any farther, I don't want to discount Augustine. I don't want to eradicate a place for sin and its importance in Christian tradition because I think it is important as a part of our human wrestling about who we are and who God is. I just don't think it's where the story starts. And someone said to me in another church when I preached this sermon, well, gosh, this, this isn't a very reformed sermon. This, this isn't really very Calvinist of you. And I said, well, actually, I think that it is. And here's how I get there. The reformers were really known for talking about total depravity. They were known for talking about people in their sinful state, but they were also known for talking about God's irresistible grace. And God's irresistible grace was the real starting point. God's irresistible grace was the thing that kicked the whole world in motion. That was the piece of our story that allows us to deal with the human condition, that allows us to deal with sin in the human condition. And so I want us to start our story in Genesis 1 with God creating the world, with God blessing the world, with God calling the world good as a framework that orients us for where God wants us to go, what God wants to do in and through us and with us. And from that vantage point of knowing God's ultimate grace, knowing God's irresistible grace, then I want to enter back in and I want to talk about sin, real sin. I have no desire to eradicate sin language from the Christian lexicon. In fact, it is so powerful as a descriptor of human behavior. As I reflect on the events of Charlottesville, Virginia, as I reflect on the reality of racism and white supremacy, I want to boldly name that as sin. Sin rooted in fear. Sin rooted in the desire to have power over fellow humans. Sin rooted in pride and feelings of moral or racial superiority. All day long, I want to name that as sin. And I want to ask hard questions of ourselves about how we may or may not be participating in those sins by our inaction, by our silence, by our uncomfortable thoughts that we might have about different groups of people. I want us to be able to look in the mirror and own sin. But in the same right, I want us to know that there was a before where God created and called things good and that there is an after, there is a place where we move through sin with God's help. The Christian story starts with creation. It starts with blessing. It starts with God's good intention for the world. One of my friends is working on his PhD, and, and we like to have conversations about his area of interest, which has to do with ethical and religious teachings around animals and around non-human living things. And he, he grew up in a Christian background. He was a preacher's son, went to seminary, and then went on to, to get his PhD in this topic. And for him, the world came alive in this creation story. So he wants to help people of faith reflect on the idea that how we treat non-human living creatures, how we treat plants, how we treat the world around us, will set the stage for then how we treat our fellow humans. And one of the more provocative things that he's ever said to me is that you very rarely meet a violent vegetarian, which is kind of funny when you think about it. Um, but but I, had, I did think about it, and he's right. I don't know that I really ever have met a violent vegetarian. Uh, and I should issue a disclaimer. As a Midwesterner through and through, I'm not going to give up steak. I like a really good steak, a juicy steak every once in a while, but I can appreciate the profoundness 
of what he had to say. Because this practice, the practice of being vegetarian, is typically rooted in either spiritual language or spiritual discipline, or this idea that all living and breathing things matter, that they're important, that they're sacred, that they're worthy, that they're valuable. That's a starting place for a story. You see, for a long time, there was an assumed ideal for all of Western civilization, an archetype, a gold standard. And the gold standard for the longest time was a white, Caucasian, Christian male of Western descent. And then kind of going down the hierarchy of importance, next came Western, Caucasian women, and then next came children, and then next came people from any other cultures, and then next came animals. And a way of shaming people historically, a way of shaming people was to compare them to something less than the gold standard or the assumed superior standard, or to knock them down a rung or two from where they sat in the social hierarchy. So for example, in Greek philosophy, if you were a noteworthy philosopher and you were arguing or battling for your ideas in the marketplace of ideas, and one of your fellow philosophers, if they compared you to a woman or a child, they were insulting you. And we see this in contemporary culture. Uh, in World War II, the Nazis compared Jewish individuals to animals. And in America, the KKK and other white supremacist groups have compared people of African descent and also Jews and also people of other minority groups to animals, and it's, it's hard and it's uncomfortable to name that out loud because there is a psychology of cruelty to that. And not only is there a psychology of cruelty, there's a psychology of fear, of scarcity at work in that language and in that kind of behavior. The implication is that some people and some groups of people are lesser, that they don't matter. But if we take this creation poem in Genesis seriously, I would suggest that what happens is it blows up that hierarchy. It inverts the order of creation. Because if we can master the idea that a blade of grass is sacred, and a carpenter ant is sacred, and a blue whale is sacred, how much more can we master the idea that our mother, our brother, our sister, our cousin, is sacred? How much more can we master the idea that our neighbor is sacred? How much more can we master the idea that the person we meet on vacation that we've never met before is sacred? How much more can we master the idea that the person who voted differently than we did, they are sacred, made, beautiful, and blessed by God? What happens if we trade what has historically been our human model of power over people and places and things to an idea of power with people and places and things. My friend who's working on his PhD, his idea is that this changes everything. It has tremendous implications if we can master the idea that a blade of grass is sacred and that animals are sacred and that plants are sacred then we can master the idea that humans all over the world are also sacred. That if we can start with this idea of blessing, that I am blessed, and you are blessed, and we are blessed, and our neighbors are blessed, that's a totally different framework. And that motivates us to go somewhere else with our story. And I think it motivates us when we do grapple, when we do wrestle with sin, real sin, that we can look at and see in the world and name as pervasive in systems and people and even in our own heart, it motivates us to really tangle with those sins in a different way. It motivates us to see the vision, the thing beyond the thing, to see what God really has for us and for our world. So the thing that I want to call us back to is this idea that the Christian story is a we story. The Christian story starts with God creating the world. And I want to take us back to that time and place thousands of years ago when we're hearing this origin story brand new and for the very first time. Can we hear it? 
Can we hear the Holy Spirit at work in creation? Can we hear God lovingly crafting every single blade of grass and calling it tov, calling it good, calling it blessed? Can we hear it in the master creating every leaf with its intricate and delicate pattern, every single leaf different, every single one a reflection of who God is and the glory and the majesty of who God is as an artist, as a creator, as one injecting our world with beauty? Can we hear it as God is creating every bird in the sky, as God is creating lions roaming the African range, as God is creating church mice? Can we hear the beauty and the blessing and the call of creation as God is at work creating women and men and people of all different races and colors and classes and creeds? Can we hear it? Can we hear this original blessing covering over our world? God starts with a world that is beautiful and dynamic and flourishing. This is where the human story begins. This is the world that God wants for us. So I have a question. Do we believe that with God's help overcoming our sins, do we believe that this world, this original vision of the world is possible? Do we believe that God wants to bring the kingdom here now? And are we willing, from the place of ultimate trust, ultimate care, ultimate vulnerability, are we willing to submit ourselves wholly and fully to God's design of original blessing? Are we willing to be brave enough to tangle with sin in our lives, real sin, and trust in the cross of Christ to help us get rid of it? Are we willing to go a step further and to address pervasive and systemic sins? like racism, which keep us from enjoying God's original blessing? Are we willing to examine soul and spirit, heart and bone? Are we willing to uproot, dismantle, and deconstruct the old order of things to usher in a new story, a better story, a new order of things? Because, friends, there is such a better story. There's a better story than fear. There's a better story than pride. There's a better story than power over. There's a story that starts with God's divine fingerprint on every blade of grass. There's a story that starts with everyone we ever meet being imbued with the beauty and the value and the sacred worth that God has for us. There's a story that starts with a world teeming and exploding with life. There's a story that starts with original blessing. And my question for us this morning is, are we willing to let it lead us where it wants us to go? Amen. And now I would invite us to stand and sing All Things Bright and Beautiful, number 20.
we will now share a, a time of prayer followed by sharing of joys and concerns. Let us pray. Loving God, we are yours. In this time of worship, we come as we are. We come with the joy of late summer celebrations, when celebrating life at home and on campus, when celebrating art at a festival and concert, when celebrating athletics at a game or race. Your creating, enlivening, and empowering spirit of life reminds us that it is you that that we live, it is in you that we live and move and have our being. Lord, you've experienced in the midst of daily life and even in the midst of celebrations that our human need for healing and wholeness cannot be bound by carefully planned appointments. So, loving Lord, we are yours. In this time of worship, we come as we are. We long to touch you and find healing in your embrace. Strengthen our faith and heal our brokenness that we may worship you with joy. Lord of abundant life, we lift up the joys upon our hearts today. I now invite you to raise your hand and um, share a joy that you have, something um, good and wonderful. And um, after each person shares his or her joy, we will reply, um, Lord, in your grace. Who has a joy to share today? Lord, in your grace. I also have a joy. Um, my husband, Joe, and I have a nephew who's serving in the Army uh, since December. He, has been, he had been in Iraq, and he came home to the United States yesterday, and we're so grateful. Lord, in your grace. Another joy? Okay, at this time, we will... Um, share concerns. Lord of all healing and wholeness, we lift up concerns upon our hearts today. Who would like to share a concern? Richard. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, in your mercy. Others? Mary Jane. Mm -hmm. For all the people who are impacted by Hurricane Harvey in Texas and the southern parts of our country. Lord, in your mercy. Let us pray. From fears that paralyze us, heal us, O oh Lord. From illness that strangles us, heal us, O Lord. From sorrows that weigh us down, heal us, O Lord. From confusion that clouds our visions, heal us, O Lord. We pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught his, his disciples to say and pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. I will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this daily bread. Let's see, give those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but lead us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we prepare for the offering, Here's a little meditation. The, word, the world tells us that time is money. 
the world tells us that money is power. Yet the world does not seem to understand the basics of philosophy that would say, therefore, time is power. Romans 12 tells us, however, do not be conformed to the world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds so that we may discern what is the will of God. In God's will, time is power. For spending time with God gives us strength. In God's will, time is power. For spending time with others gives them strength. Thank you for giving of your time, your gifts, and your offerings. The ushers, please come forward. And now let us come together for a time of prayer. 
Gracious God, we ask that you would bless these resources. We ask that you would bless our time, that you would bless our talents, that you would bless our strengths. Lord, we ask that you would nourish us, that you would empower us, that you would send us out into a world that so desperately needs to hear of your love and your grace and your peace. And Lord, we ask that all of these resources are used to your glory, to the advancement of your church in the world, and for love of neighbor. And we pray all of these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Our final hymn is His Eye is on the Sparrow, number 661. Everlasting God, let us dwell this day on blessings.
For you have made all creatures great and small, all things fashioned and formed by you, all things blessed and called good by you. May our relationship with all creatures, great and small, mirror your intentionality, your spacious love, your care, and your bountiful mercy. Nourish us with your words, empower us in fellowship and community, and send us out to offer your grace and peace to all. Amen. And now I'd like to leave you all with a benediction. Thank you.